I'd rather create something that others criticize than create nothing and criticize others. If you have high quality product behind the bar, it's like weapon. It's not about the figures. It's about who those figures are. The Hospopreneurs Podcast. I'm going to drink this beer. Yeah, let's crack it. With James Henderson. Hello and welcome to episode 66 of the Hospopreneurs Podcast. My guest today is one of the best known distillers in the world. Beginning as an apprentice cooper in 1963, Jim McEwen eventually came to manage the Bemore Distillery and then travelled the world for another 33 years as a judge, ambassador and distiller for Brook Lardy and the Botanist as well. He was inducted into Whiskey Magazine's Hall of Fame in 2014 and in the same year founded Cape Byron Distillery with Eddie Brook, who you may recall from way back on episode 16. They've been known best for their award-winning Brookies Gin, but are now beginning to produce whiskey. This interview takes place on the balcony overlooking the famous Brook Farm and regenerated rainforest, so there's a bit of ambient noise to note, but it worked as inspiration for the last interview Jim will have in Australia. Hello and welcome to the show, Jim and Eddie. Thank you, James. Thank you. Good to meet you. And- Welcome to Byron Bay and Jim <laughs> No worries at all. Jim, welcome to Hospopreneurs and Eddie, it's your second episode on the show. Uh, first repeat guest. I actually think it's exactly 50 episodes after your episode. Oh, you're kidding which me. Which is crazy. That oh. sounds like time for a party. It yeah. does, yeah, if there's any time for it. We're in the right place for it. Jim, I'd like to open the episode by asking what your crazy hospitality story is. I've had so many great hospitality moments. I think the biggest one was I was managing Bowmore Distillery on the island of Ireland. And what got around that, we were being bought out by a very famous Japanese company called Santori. And so I was a manager and I got a message from my chairman to say, Jim, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock there will be four helicopters arriving close to the distillery. And I'm thinking, wow what's going on here. I said, could you find a spot to lay them down, put the helicopters down? I said, sure. So I went to local uh, primary school where my two kids were at attending and I spoke to head mistress and I said, uh, so I didn't know who was in the helicopters, you understand? I just know there's four choppers coming in. That's a big deal in Isla, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, she said, yeah, bring them down. And she said, it'll be great for the kids. They can go outside and wave for the helicopters coming down. I still don't know who's in the helicopter. I know my chairman is, I know the financial director is, the da 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 two helicopters. Uh, this is the Morrison Bermuda distiller. So, 10 o'clock, coming out of the west coast, there's four choppers, it's like Vietnam. Flying in. And my chairman will not tell me anything, you understand? It's top secret. Companies were afraid if the word got out that Morris and Bermuda were selling to a Japanese company, the industry would turn against them because you were selling to mm. Japanese and Japanese were famous for being the great copiers at that time. They would copy anything. It's totally changed today. Japanese distillers are phenomenal. Anyway, the helicopters landed and I stepped forward and I meet my chairman and I said, good morning, Mr. Chairman. And I said, who do we have today? He says, well, we actually have the president of Santori. And I'm thinking, wow. So I go forward to the next helicopter and off the helicopter helicopter comes Shintori, who owns Santori, and his stunningly attractive wife. And I shake hands with him, and I'm thinking, what is going on? And, uh, and the other two helicopters were full of lawyers for the signing of it. And what the headmistress at the primary school had done, she allowed all the kids to go out and wave to the people in the helicopters, right? So I'm <laughs> walking down with Shintori <laughs> and my chairman and the wives and the accountants, and it's like a parade from the helicopter, and all the children are waving, hi! <laughs> and the president of Santori and his wife, Rico, they think they know who they are, and they're waving and bowing. <laughs> and my two kids are there, right? And suddenly, Lynn and Leslie, who are in the crowd, who are like seven and five, they don't realize I, I am completely crapping it. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> and my two kids run from the crowd, and one catches my left leg, and one catches my right leg, and I'm trying to keep walking beside Shintori with two animals hanging to my leg. I said, no, go away, go away, go. And Shintori, the president of Shintori, his wife, goes, Jim, who are they? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who they are. He said, ah, this is your children, Jim. I said, yeah, this is my children. And so Shintori, you know, king of the world. He bent down and he said to Lynn, hello, perfect American English. Hello, what is your name? She said, 
My name is Lynn, and I have got a horse called Oliver. Really? Oh, that's nice. And the other one, Leslie, he said, and what's your name? And she had no teeth at the front. And she said, my name is Leslie, and I'm a very good singer. Oh, really? So we jury went down to the distillery, and I stood there, and I witnessed the sale of Morris Moore Distillers, the Hockentosha and Moore. That was amazing. Some three years later, I was on tour in Japan teaching Santori people about Ireland and all that sort of stuff. And I was invited up to meet the president once again, which was a huge honour for me. So I eventually got up to his suite and there he was. He said, hello, Jim. so good to see you. I was training Santori people. And he says, please sit down. And we sat down and we had a couple of aides beside him and we had a chat. This is the best moment. I've met a lot of clever people. This man was exceptional. This is three years after the day. He said, tell me, Jim, Lynn, she will be nine years old now. Does she still have a horse called Oliver? And Leslie, is Leslie still singing in the choir? Wow. Mm -hmm. Talk about preparation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely sensational. So we had a little chat, I said, yeah, they're doing fine. He said, Jim, I want you to go to my private bar next door. Do you remember when we bought the company from uh, Morrison's? I said, yeah. I was there, I was a witness. And he said, well, I was presented with a very special bottle of Black Bomore, bottle number one. He said, it's in my private bar and I've never opened it. I want you to be the person who opens that bottle. And I'm thinking, well, I can't say no because that would be hurtful to the Japanese people to refuse such a, a really good gift. And I said, well, that's extremely kind of, it, of you, sir. And I really appreciate such a wonderful gift, but I really feel I shouldn't do this. I am not worthy of this gift, he said. Please. At that point, you know, to not accept the gift would be an insult to him. So he said, OK, Jim, goodbye. I have to go. I said, thank you. It's been, thank you for giving me your time. He said, no, you're doing a fantastic job teaching everybody. So I go in. This is the tallest building in Tokyo. And I've got two aides with me who are guiding me around. And I go into this phenomenal bar, all of Tokyo in the background. And there in this cabinet is bottle number one that marked the purchase of Suntory of the Moor. And so I went and I opened the bottle and I thought, oh, shit, I'm going to have a real good drama of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really going to have a belter. So I poured myself a really large one. And I'm standing there in the tallest building in Japan. In my hands, I have a whiskey that I filled into the cask in 1964. I'm standing there, I'm looking out, I'm sipping, I'm thinking, Jim McEwen, where did it all go wrong for you? <laughs> <laughs> Best moment of my life. What a story. Best whiskey of my life. I'm there. I thought, this amazing whiskey. I mean, this whiskey was so valuable. I'm standing there like, how did you get here? How the hell? Mm. You know, I started work at 15 as a bar maker. I'm standing here with the best whiskey be more than me. So there are many moments like that, but the point I'm making is, what a wonderful man. He offered me that gift. Wasn't that wonderful? Beautiful. In that though, it wasn't just that he offered you a gift, it was that he remembered a lot more than you expected him to remember about you, about your children. My children, what yeah. he did. I mean, so clever. Excellent. He knew the names, he knew one of the horse, he knew one was singing in the choir. That was so impressive. Yeah. He had done his homework. Obviously, as we were on the Isla tour when he was coming, one of his aides was taking notes all the time. So he had the note, Isla visit, Jim McHugh. Mm -hmm. Preparation, preparation. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing that episode, Jim. It was yeah, an amazing can, story. Having yeah. spoken, but I can actually still taste the whiskey now. <laughs> Uh, however, soon we'll have whiskey from next door, it'll taste just as good, I hope. I think so. The next question I'd like to ask is more around the big picture and why you do what you do. So if we go super macro, super wide, why is it that you do what you do? By saying, why do I do what I do? It's just an all-consuming passion. I really love this thing and I like a challenge, I really love a challenge and it's been that way all my life, I like to push the boundaries, I mean in my time I've made quadruple distilled whiskey, people said that can't be done, really? Just done it, just done it and so on and so forth with, and using different casts, I mean we were using Abrofladi, we were using Chateau Margot, Latour, Lafitte, Barolo, Barbaresco, Sasakaya, Amarone, we were experimenting to go where no man has gone before, mm. that's really the thing behind it and to educate consumers about the quality of whiskey, I was really, really 
totally against artificial colouring in whisky, which is called E150. The colour should come naturally from the cask. You shouldn't be conning the customer by making people naturally assume because it's a very dark colour, it's very, very good. Nothing could be further from the truth, you know, because people use E150 and E150 is sugar. So why do you want to put sugar into alcohol? You've just distilled it to get the sugar out. So these sort of things kind of get me wound up a little bit and it's just been kind of restless. I got to keep mm. doing it and probably save my marriage as well, <laughs> keeping out of the house for so long. And then we, I met Eddie and I met somebody and Eddie who had virtually the same passion and enthusiasm as I had, but mm. much, much more ex experience in the bar side of it and the, the customer side of it than I ever had, you know. And we just seemed to hit it off because you had mm. the two passions coming together, you know. Never ever did I think that we would end up making gin and whiskey together. But I think the gin has proven beyond all doubt to be a massive success using the natural botanicals from the rainforest. I did the same in Isla, using the natural botanicals from Isla to make the botanist. And people were amazed, they didn't realize how beautiful these flavors could be. And Eddie, I found a much younger, but a kindred spirit in everything we do. He's got the same passion, the same integrity, and the same honesty. So it seemed like the old guy and the young guy get together, and it's been a brilliant fit, because I respect him and he respects me. And between the two of us, we've combined knowledge. It's quite phenomenal and never taking it for granted. You know, you must always consider the consumer. The consumer is the king. Without a consumer, we are nothing. But if you can educate the consumer, the consumer will become an educator himself. It's like Eddie planting a seed in there. That tree will rise and shed its own seed. Mm. And that's what happens with really good drinks, like alcoholics, the bartender is knowledgeable. So Eddie and I spent so much time educating bartenders around Australia. We did, how many tastings did we do? Yeah, when uh, we first met on that tour for Brook Laddie, the Rockstar Tour, it's, it's renowned as now. We did 22 sellout shows of about 100 people plus, all packing into auditoriums to come hear the stories of Isla and drink a few drams. And Mm. Of course, they become disciples because once you impart knowledge in somebody, you will always remember <laughs> the people who gave you knowledge. If I ask you this question, what was the name of your first teacher when you went to school? I bet you you know her Yeah, name. I know. Mm. It was Mrs. Wallace. I remember. <laughs> you never, ever forget the people who give you knowledge. Mm. I can remember the name of every teacher right through school because they were giving me knowledge. And it's the same way we were until we were imparting knowledge to the consumer. And then it was just awe inspiring when you see that the awakening Ah, we didn't realise about mm. whiskey, single malt whiskey is different. We thought it was Johnny Walker and all that sort of stuff. And we also put, nobody knew about an island called Isla off the West Coast. I think mm. Scotch is Scotch is Scotch. Well, we're a very small island and we're famous for making smoky whiskies. Mm. You know, it's a flavour that's very much associated with Isla. I want to open a little bit more on Isla a little bit later in the episode, but in your answer there around passion, the reason that you love it or why you do what you do is because you're so passionate about it. We had a walk through the rainforest before the episode and had an amazing chat along the way. And I discussed a bit of an analogy around a key that I might elaborate on in the episode, but for the purpose of this recording, I'd like to know what it is specifically about what you do that allows you to exercise that thirst that you have. Everyone sort of has this thirst. They either uncover at some point or early on or late, but what is it specifically about what you do that allows you to be sated? Well, not totally sated. I don't think we can ever truly be 100% satisfied with that expression that we yeah. have, but do you want to elaborate on that? Um, it's like Don Quixote tilting at windmills. That's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm like the Don Quixote. Remember the horse at the windmill, you know, that's going to be, I think really what drives me on, I'm extremely proud of my country. Really extremely proud of me. I'm definitely a nationalist. I want us to be free. And when you take it down to Isla, I'm even more passionate about that. And it's just the way you are. We all have a passion. Yours might be rock and roll and yours might be whatever. You know, we all have a passion. And the reward is tangible. When you impart that little bit of knowledge to a bartender, for example, and there's great bartenders and great mixers. But there's still a huge amount of work to be done with bartenders with regards to single malt whiskey and the difference in the region. And of course, there's plenty of brand ambassadors going around, but generally brand ambassadors by the very nature of the job are promoting their product only mm -hmm. and everybody else is nonsense. But for myself, it's promoting Scotland mm -hmm. and all the distilleries and some of the greatest whiskies I've tasted have come from Speyside and the Highlands and so on and so forth. So it's a kind of, kind of an adrenaline junkie. 
I get high. When you see the light come on in somebody's eyes, they've been drinking whiskey all, or they've been putting ice in single malt, and why are you doing this, you know? And why are you putting Diet Coke into it, stuff like that. So when you impart knowledge, even when we were doing these tastings, you know what I mean? Yeah. You could actually see about maybe 50% of the people here you know, nosing it and then adding the water once they've nosed it first and all that sort of stuff and treating it with respect and trying to get to know the character of the people who made this and the DNA is in the aroma. I mean, if you go to Africa, you'll get a different aroma and we'll get the aroma of Ireland. But why am I still doing it? Because I actually love it. I love what I do. I love imparting knowledge. And it's given me the great opportunity to travel and meet some incredible people. I mean, like the books here, I mean, we've become really, really firm friends. And here we're making single malt whiskey. Isn't that brilliant? And Edgy will become an educator as well. So life, my friend, is a baton race. Right now, I'm carrying this particular baton and I'm passing it on to Eddie Brooks. He will run his race and he will pass it on. So. We never stop running. Always somebody will be carrying that baton of knowledge. And with whiskey being such an old, old spirit, it stands examination. A single malt will always stand examination. Cocktails come and cocktails go and wines come and wines go, but single malt has that charisma, that honesty and that integrity about it over the centuries. It will always stand out. And if you get the right people like Eddie behind it explaining to the consumer, they will pass the baton on. What about how processes change over time? Is, is it a longer cycle, a longer life cycle for whiskey, for example? Or is it a shorter lifespan for cocktails well, and a longer life cycle for whiskey? Whiskey will go the distance because you've got such a selection of great single malts in Scotland. Mm. There's no been in Scotland making bad whiskey. That's for sure. We've been doing it for a long time. And there's a great variety with Scotch whiskey. People say, yeah, it's a single malt. But no, single malts have been around for a long, long time. And each of them is just slightly different from the highlands to the lowlands to the space side to Isla. And each one has its own particular love for bourbon cast or sherry cast and so on. So it'll go on and on and on, you know. And it's a mood thing as well. Sometimes I'm really tired or I just need a lift, I will definitely go home to Isla. I mean, one of my most memorable drums was I was down in Miami, I was on tour and I had a really tough tour and I was exhausted and I was getting really, really homesick. I was just getting tired, it was a tough trip. Now I got into Miami and all I wanted to do was get in my bedroom and have a whiskey, right? I wanted to smell home. So I went to the bar and I asked the bartender, do you have any whiskeys from the island of Isla? He was a very good bartender. He said, yeah. He said, I've got a scotch here called Leapfrog. I said, yeah, you just said the right word. I said, could you pour me a large, really large, like three shots in a glass, Lafroy? He said, certainly, sir. You look yeah. as low you need it. I said, man, I need it. Most amazing experience. So I've got a suite in the top floor overlooking the ocean in Miami. So I put my kilt, I carry a kilt and all that stuff, which is about a thousand kilos, it feels like. And I strip off and I have a shower and I go onto the balcony, right? And I'm waiting for this moment to drink the Lafroy. It's got to be right. So I have a shower and I go outside and I've got a good cigar and I light my cigar and it's this huge tropical storm coming in. I've never seen anything like it because mm. we don't get that. And there's lightning crackling and it's thunder and there's stuff rolling across the ocean. And I'm sitting in the top balcony of this hotel in my underpants <laughs> with a large Lafroy, I mean a triple Lafroy and a good cigar. And I'm smelling home, do you understand? Mm. I am thousands and thousands of miles <coughs> in my nose and on my palate. I'm home with Lafroy. And I was so tired and I drank the whiskey and the storm is coming closer. And I must have woke up about 20 minutes later and it was lashing of rain. So I'm sitting there soaking wet with water in my glass. My cigar has gone out and I'm completely drenched. And I'm thinking, what is going on? <laughs> so you get amazing moments like that, you know, because mm. you're by yourself. I just, at that point, I just, mm. I was so tired. I just wanted to smell home. It could have been Lagavulin, it could have been Bomore. It's that distinctive flavor of your DNA. Great memories, you know, but that's just the way it is, you know. Thanks for sharing. You've shared, uh, what, what I want to really try to explore is your philosophy on life, really, through whiskey. And we've got a taste of it so far and there's more I have in my arsenal to sort of bring that out. But in doing that, I just want to elaborate on something there first. Your idea around, it's the people aspect, and, and I know that that's true for Eddie and the Book family, is that it's around the people behind the yeah. product. I'd like to know how you put that in the glass. 
how do you get that story and put it in the glass? With relation to working with people, encouraging people, educating people. I mean, what we have here is Eddie and his family are educating people how to distill, which is quite incredible. They're educating bartenders here, but particularly in the distillation of both of the gin, Brookie's gin and of the new whiskey. It's a privilege to be able to impart knowledge into people who are prepared to receive the knowledge. How do you prepare people to receive that knowledge? It's quite simple. You learn to read people as you go through life. Generally, when you meet somebody, you make an opinion on by what you see. That guy doesn't look too clever, you know what I mean? I don't like him too much. However, you will find when you get to know people a bit more, people who think the same as you and you can trust. And it's to them you pass on the message. I mean, there's some guys working here at the story who are going to be superb distillers. There's no doubt about it. But you learn how to educate people who want to receive education. The Bible tells you clearly, do not cast pearl among swine. Pigs don't appreciate diamonds, do you understand? So don't give knowledge to somebody who's not going to appreciate it. Pigs, you know, do not appreciate pearls. So when you find somebody like Eddie Brooks who's got the absolute passion, I'm happy to pass my baton on to Eddie Brooks, my baton of knowledge. If it was a relay race in life, my life is just about over, I'm passing on to him and he will pass it on to his team in there. So you've got to find the right place to plant your seed. I know we're here in the jungle and all that, and that's not a flippant statement. Don't waste time with people who are not going to appreciate what you're giving them. And the greatest gift you can give anyone in this world is education. It's the greatest gift you can impart. So if I can impart that and Eddie, he will do the same. Mm. So I'm giving it to a fertile caddy and he will educate here, he'll educate bartenders and all this. Whiskey is more than just a drink, you understand? This is the blood of Scotland. Why God gave us whiskey, I don't know. Because with a small, tiny nation of four million people scattered over some of the worst, wildest places there, he gave it to us because he knew we would educate the world. He chose us for that very reason. We were genuine and we would educate. So it's finding people who feel the same way about a product. I mean, I know you feel the same way. We went down to yeah. the, the forest there and what you were saying was exactly what I'm saying about whiskey. Yeah. It was just mm. exactly the same. Mm. So you now have that knowledge of making whiskey and making gin. So you will become a great disciple. You will pass it on and people will benefit from you passing on the knowledge. So it's not a flippant thing. It's not something I take lightly, but we only come in this way once. There is no return ticket. So you're here once, you've got to make the absolute best of everything every opportunity you can and be a good person and don't be abusive and don't insult people just get on if you don't like it walk past it you don't stand in holes in the road you go around mm. so uh, surround yourself with people who are passionate they don't have to be terribly educated but if they're passionate and honest whether they're bartenders whatever people you can rely on if i said to you how many friends do you have that would go to any lengths for you you could count them in one hand somebody said hey buddy james I've been in a car accident, I'm getting my leg amputated and I don't know what I'm going to survive. Could you be there? How many people could you make that call to? So, to educate and not just what you're doing, but your passion. And you should tell people if you like them, mm. I really respect you. I have no problems saying that to people. Well done. You're a great guy. I really appreciate you. And we don't do that often enough. Mm. We're very fit. We all have a hundred friends, but when the chips are down, who can I count on? Mm. Outside of family, mm -hmm. very few. On one hand, if you're lucky. But the great thing about what we do making alcohol, it brings people together. And I'm more conscious than anyone else about alcoholism. And people say, oh, you're promoting alcohol all the time. Do you not feel there's too many alcoholics in the world? I can't help that situation, you know what I mean? Not many alcoholics will drink single malt, but there are a few. These are choices that these people make. They have an option to drink it or not to drink it, to eat it or not to eat it, whether it's food or obesity is now going crazy. So it's just really trying to walk. It's not a difficult path to walk. It's just an honest path, you know. You mm. know yourself. You know if you're not telling the truth. You know if you're not 100% behind it. The person you're talking to doesn't know, but you know, you understand. So you've got to be honest with yourself all the time and not be afraid to speak your mind. Don't say yes just to appease the person. If you don't agree with it, so I'm really I'm sorry, but I don't agree with what you say and here's the reason why, you know. And also, I generally have a whiskey every night and I use that before I go to bed or maybe an hour before I go to bed and I sit and I just think you know I think about it in the right place and it's good that we relax this year and we all need to relax because it's a busy world now you know there's people flying about all over the place.
and there's so much coming down through television now. It's almost like an open sewer. You've got all this stuff coming down, the pollution of young minds. I mean, they're watching the Jeremy Kyle show and all this sort of stuff. And there's huge expectations upon young girls now. There must be. It's just disgusting. So you've got to try and stand up and be honest and be a decent person. It's really quite simple. And if you can impart some knowledge in the way we're trying to do here, I can assure you that anything that Eddie produces here will be the best he can do. He will not release anything that he's not personally happy with. I would probably never be back in this country, but I know I'm leaving this man in good hands. And he has a responsibility to educate his team, not just in making gin, but educating them about life and the importance of the customer and how important the customer is to treat them with respect. You've opened up a can of worms there, but you did ask the question. I wanted that. <laughs> this, is what, this is what I try to get out, so. What I'd like to explore further is, you mentioned that we went on the walk in the rainforest before, and what we really saw, I think I can summarize it, was here you can see time. Yeah, yeah, that's, definitely, yeah. For me, that's what summarizes that concept of sublimity. The feeling that when you're here, you can see that effort, see that patience, see a snippet of that experience. You see a snapshot of that experience. And I think that's what's so powerful. Can I interrupt you just for a second? Of course. You're the first person I've met, and I've met millions that's ever used the word sublimity. I've never heard that used before. Isn't that incredible? And I really get where you're going. Thank you very much. It's just phenomenal. You've opened my eyes, you know. Carry on, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So for those listening, I've discussed beauty versus sublimity maybe one or two times before, but it's a concept I like to sit with because it's such a powerful experience when, and I'll try to delineate between the two. So beauty is what we understand to be aesthetically, not just physically, but aesthetically in some aspect, it could be music or art or an art form, but what really makes something powerful as art is the sublime. And it's this feeling of being insignificant in something so large and I summarize that concept with infinity I call it infinity and I like to sit with that concept and so what I've noticed is that everyone really wants to leave a legacy of some description in the world whether it's a plant or a business or a dream this is how we decide to spend our lives and how we pass the baton on people then experience our touch on the world and I just love sitting with that concept and being here and hearing that story, the story about how the place we're in now has come about, reminds me of that. Sitting with time, experiencing and seeing a snapshot of time. Because everything that we experience in life, it's not a 3D object, it's a four dimensional object because it traverses time as well. And to see that here reminds you of the sublime. And I think that's, that's what's so powerful about it being here and the story that you tell. Yeah, I think in particular, a lot of people, especially in Brisbane and Gold Coast bartenders, they've got to experience this. If you come here now and you see the rainforest and we went for a walk through, you see these trees that it looks like it's been here for almost hundreds of years. Jim talks a lot about it, but we sort of quite believe it. We're a bit of a mad family, but we always about believe in, in just doing good things and trusting the path. It sounds a bit strange, but how we came to be here is quite a strange story, literally. My mum was a dentist, dad was a film producer, and they were living in Melbourne. They always knew they wanted to bring up their family, do the sea change, bring them up in the country, but they also had this yearning to just to have a positive impact. And anyway, one extremely, I'll say there may have been a bottle or two of wine consumed, they threw a dart on the map of Australia, and it landed in a little place just south of here called Evans Head. And that next day, they literally packed their bags with some friends, came here, and went looking for land. And long story short, they ended up purchasing land here via fax which they bought land unseen of 95 acres of this completely run down dairy farm now to put this in your mind's eye this farm here which is you know in the hinterland of byron which is i think of byron bay now it's very lush and rainforesty and this was a dust bowl it was barely even grass holding the soil together it was dairy farm and this whole land used to be the largest subtropical rainforest in australia it was known as the big scrub and again it was trusting that path and you know I talk a little bit about serendipity. My whole journey 
journey of how I've come to be and my family's path, how I got to meet Jim. And it's around trusting a path and it's good people doing good things for the right reasons. And yeah, they fell in love. I talk about Dad got the rainforest bug and his life work has been regenerating the land. So you take 30 years ago, they invested in planting 35,000 rainforest trees. Now you say that to anyone 30 years ago, you go, you're absolutely mad. You know, why the hell are you putting your own dollars into that? Because it's not just for the reason of putting a dollar in, getting a dollar out. There's something of greater value of what they were investing and what they were doing. And that foresight, and you touched on it, that foresight and that patience, that's what now we see and we get to sit here you know on the veranda of the distillery set amongst the rainforest in lush landscape and it's that's i suppose that foresight and that patience is what we're now going to be taking into that world of whiskey which is kind of a a thing that sort of flows through our family Mm. this is like this is serendipity here yeah (laughs) who would have thought we should have caught one of our whiskey serendipity yeah thanks to you i'll trademark that one there do you want to just write that It's a beautiful story, and thank you for sharing more on that as well. Also, if um, any listeners who'd like to hear more on Eddie's episode, it's back around episode 15, 16, a long time ago. Back a long time show, ago. <laughs> a couple of years ago now. Short in the whiskey world. Well, you've got to rectify that. You've got to come yes. to Scotland. Yeah, 100%. And uh, continue the story by coming to yes. Isla or whatever. I think so. Uh, I might have to meet you there next time. We'd be delighted to welcome you. Thank you, Jim. And because you will become a disciple and you will bring the story back here and you will educate the people here. It's education, education. I have a, a quick question for you, Eddie. Yep. Around the Davidson Plum. Before the episode, you told me about the Davidson Plum. How do you manage people's expectations if you can't supply the demand? You've got great demand, but how do you then manage the expectations if you can't supply? I think it again comes down to that education. What we're using in this, the Davidson Plum is that primary flavor that we use in our slow gin. So, you know, to make our slow gin, we take this Davidson Plum. Now this Davidson Plum comes from the rainforest of this region. It's not like it was brought here and grown here. This is its home. This has been here long long, long before any humans walk this land around here. You cannot get more intrinsic to Northern Rivers than this fruit. You know, the DNA gets traced to Mullumbimby 10 k's away. And that fruit to make our slow gin, we take this native Davidson plum and we steep it into our gin and it rests there for on average between eight and up to 12 months to achieve that flavor. So it's a lot of time on spirit. But if we went to do say a lemon gin or a lemon cello or something, I could call up a number of farmers. I could even look overseas to get this fruit. and. When we're looking at the Davidson Plum, that's not the case. We grow a fair bit here, but how we actually source it is we go direct to farmers in Northern Rivers. And then you take a step back and you look at the bush food industry. We talk about food culture, right? Australia, if you go to any other place in the world that has unique native foods, it's that produce that kind of makes up and is the cornerstone of their of that food culture, food and drink culture. For us in Australia, we're only just becoming aware of it. We're still lifetimes away, really. And, and that comes down to an education piece you know we should be so proud about our native foods you know we should see finger limes in every single restaurant in every bar around Australia and that's what we hope to be a part of in increasing that education around Mm. what they are how they're grown and how to use them but then creating those supply chains to get them there but these Davidson plums it's not like I can call these farmers that have been commercially farming them for a long time matter of fact the Davidson plum industry about 30 or 25 30 years ago everyone invested in because they thought it was on this tipping stone of booming a lot of people invested and yet the demand never took off and as a result a lot of these farmers actually went out of business so there's a lot of davidson plum farms around here where fruit hits the ground because it costs them too much to actually harvest it than than what it is and a lot of farmers have actually removed their davidson plums so for us to get and manage that crop we work directly with these native food growers and we pride ourselves on the relationships we've built with them and it comes back to this honesty you know we work with them because our slow gin won't won't exist unless we have that native fruit growing. Mm. So we work extremely, extremely hard with our farmers. And in fact, we even go as far as purchasing crops in advance. Davidson Plum, the, the Jersey Arna, the native Northern Rivers variety, grows once a year in December. We have to purchase, snap freeze, and use that throughout the year. So you think about with that, it's not like we tell that farmer, you know, because 
he picks the crop, he's got to pay his wages to the people he employs, mm. his freezer costs. So we actually purchase in advance for 12 months. But we're now working with these farmers because for us, it's so far the slow gin. You yeah. sort of know it's got this, everyone that tastes it, there's something that they're loving the flavor. You know, mixability in cocktails, but I get excited about, imagine bringing that native Davidson plum to the UK, to America, you know, <laughs> them tasting that unique flavor of Australia, then I get excited by that. What I'd like to know is how I can buy futures in Davidson plums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I really want to know. Well, I'll tell you what, if you buy it, we'll buy the plums off you, that's for sure. <laughs> but yeah, we're now working with those farmers and we're actually working with them and their businesses and they're now investing into doubling their plantings. Mm. Now they plant today, that won't bear fruit commercially for them for four to five years. Mm. So we're now having to work with them and it's exciting. And this is the stuff as a family we love doing, you know, about if there's a challenge so great, we love to rise to it. So we're working with them and we've got now engaging a number of different farmers and properties and areas where we're actually growing or working with those farmers to invest to put more Davidson plums down. So in the next five years, even up to 10 years, we'll have that amount of crop because there's nothing worse than when a customer comes to the cellar door or a bar tries to water it and they get the uh, out of stock. Mm. We, we don't want that. So it's about managing that growth and we only supply customers. You know, if I sell to a bar, we sell to a bottle shop, we're making a commitment that we can steadily supply them. It's not a one-off, you know, we want to be able to, but we are limited in how much we can get but then that's about connecting those dots keeping those relationships building so we've got fruit for many years to come because i mean then you've got the pressure with the restricted supply and, and high demand economics just says that the price is going to increase so i mean there's always that pressure to do that as well and that is an option nothing that's good comes cheap you understand yeah and where that added cost comes from the farmers and the five-year wait and all that stuff but in terms of from a health point of view you just look at the drink it looks absolutely Look, the colour is sensational. You mm. know, the texture is beautiful. The strength is what, 25 or 26%. 26%. Yeah. It's a perfect long drink, you know. And the colour just entices you and you want to drink it. Mm. And it's real. It's not artificial colouring. Mm. This is the real deal. I'm sure it's going to do very well in the UK because we're kind of on a health kick just now regarding alcohol. People yeah. are aware of that's why more and more distillers are stopping using artificial colouring because your first impact with anything you buy, whether it's a motor car or a suit or a shirt or a drink is the visual. Davidson Plum is stunning and it follows through. Visually it's exciting but on the palate and the finish it's just mm. and you feel like the vitamin C just surging through your body. It's yeah. phenomenal, you know. <laughs> Not alcohol, selling it as a health tonic but hey, you never know. <laughs> well, as <I> alcohol. <laughs> exactly. But it yeah. does, you can get that it vitamin does. C, you know. I have a couple of questions from listeners, Jim. Well, the first is from Gilbert. He said he'd like to know how to stay relevant in a potentially saturated market. How can a brand compete in a very competitive market? I think you're right back to education and honesty and integrity. That's what you really, really need. There's so many brands out there. The consumer, at the end of the day, he will buy it if he likes it. And if he doesn't like it, he won't buy it. There's so many whiskies out there and there's so many different types of casts being used now and there are all sorts of stories being put out there. And it's not hard to do a little bit of research. There's so much books on whiskey now and websites on whiskey and all that sort of stuff. And I think the brands that have been around a long time have survived because they are good. You understand? If you take some of the Talaskers and the Highland Parks and the Glen Livets, I mean, there's a whole raft of them there. If you look at the history of when they first started distillation in the space side and all that sort of stuff, the customer has deemed that they will survive because the customer enjoys what they do. So they will not change that recipe regardless of what's happening, if people are changing their trends, there will always be whiskies to supply that market. But it's a real stalwart feeling about, I mean, I was at Bermore, Bermore was built in 1779. I mean, think of it, what mm. an experience of into that whole generation's whole family's father's to son. And that gives you the pride. So if in doubt, you're not sure about it, and it's very, very cheap, there's got to be something. Blends are made up of grain whiskey and single malt. And the cheaper a blended whiskey is, the more grain whiskey it's in there and the less malt. It's mm. quite simple. You marry malts together, you mix it with grain whiskey. And the cheaper it is, there's not such a thing ever being created as a good, cheap whiskey. So have you ever seen a cheap Rolls Royce? No. 
it's not difficult. If you just do a little bit of reading, you'll be rewarded because the stories about whiskey are really, really good and the, the history of the distillery. And if you're buying single malt, it clearly indicates that you have some spending power. Otherwise, you'd be buying other stuff, you know, mm. you'd be buying beer and that sort of stuff. And it's a fantastic journey to go on to read about a distillery and then try it and write your own tasting notes. And, and whiskey's a drink for sharing. I'm talking single malt here with one or two of your mates and trying it and do a little whiskey tasting and improve a new knowledge. Also, because of the range of whiskies and the age, you know, for example, the earlier they are, the younger the whiskey. So if I'm having a whiskey when I come home from what? I'll go young. I'll do a Brooklady Classic, which is seven years old. I need that. I've had a really tough day. I need something that's young and fresh, mm. not going to challenge me too much, a little bit of water in it. I'll have a dram, I'll shower, have a dram. And then as the evening goes on, I'll move up, you understand? So maybe before I go to bed, I'll have an 18-year-old or a 21-year-old. So that's how I would do it, you know? And enjoy the young one because at some point, it's going to be an 18-year-old as well. Because I, say, I remember you when you were eight years old. Look mm. at you now, you're 18. Mm. Jesus, you've really done well, you know mm. what I mean? So you develop a love for certain brands and you stay mm. with them. And I can assure you that out there, there will be one that will suit your temperament. Mm. It will suit everything that you hold dear. I guarantee you, you use the same aftershave all the time. Yeah, I thought so. That's what we do. When yes. we find something we love, we will stay with it. Yeah. Why? Because it doesn't let us down. Mm. And it's the same with single malt. Make the journey of discovery yourself. It's a really tough journey to go on, you know, drinking whiskey. And you will find whiskies that suit you and just stay with them, you understand? It's a great, great journey. Different times. The younger the hour, the younger the whiskey. I like that. I'd like to know Jim, what you're learning about or exploring now? Where is it that you're pushing things forward or innovating? I think here with the Brooks family, we had such a good result with the gin and Eddie's become a skilled distiller as have a number of his staff. And with Eddie having me as the tour manager and he picked up on the passion for Scotland. He's been to Scotland, he's done the whole bit. So it seemed only natural to me that Eddie would follow in the footsteps. If you tell them, they will follow, you know what I mean? And it comes as no surprise to me that Eddie has decided to make single malt whiskey because he's picked up, he's been to Scotland, he's picked up on what we're all about in single malt whiskey. And he has actually fallen in love with Scotch whiskey. It's a romance, you understand? It's not, you know, whiskey supposed to be a huge manly drink and worn by hairy Scotsman with no wonder pants. And it's, it's not. It's a sophisticated, <laughs> elegant drink and people have actually fall in love with it and they will follow it. And Eddie has the knowledge and the distillation skills how to make gin. So it's very, very easy to go across to making whiskey, but the wait is much, much longer. I think you would agree that it seemed a natural thing for you to do, Eddie. Yeah. Having been in tour with me and did a lot of tastings yourself, I and mean, you did thousands of tastings, you become infected by it, it gets under your skin, and you want more because it's the same with life. If you find something that you enjoy and believe in, whether it's Christianity or whether it's people, or, and you've got half a brain in your head, you want to learn more because you want the whole experience. Now, you've had half the experience, and now you want to complete the circle by making your own whiskey. And when you do that, you will have exactly the same passion as I have because you have created something that nobody else in the world has a like of. It's unique to this area, it's unique to you and your distillery scum. That's the biggest privilege any man can do, to create something that the world is going to enjoy. How many people actually get that opportunity? Most don't, because they're multinational companies. But you are here with your family. I mean, for you, you're in a fabulous position, and I have absolutely no doubts you will carry that passion, honesty, and integrity into your spirit, for sure. And I'm not saying that because you're sitting across from me. I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe that, do you understand? I'll be back in Scotland. The reason I'm here is because of you and your family and your honesty and integrity. And I know at the end of the day, you will give that the same love and respect that you've given everything I can see around me. And all these trees and everything, you've done it. That will manifest itself in the spirit. This is going to be the spirit of your family. I'd like to know, Jim, what is your biggest challenge right now? If you're talking from a personal level or a professional level, my biggest challenge professionally, this will be my last ever distillation. I'm re retired when I go back home, this is the last one I'll ever do. I'm not going to distill anymore. I'm now 70 years of age. I've been doing this for 55 years. I've got grandchildren. So this one's really, really special because it's the last one. And uh, we're one by one. So I'm 
it's a good way to end, you know what I mean? Because that, my whole life has been as an educator and here I am, my last day study will not be in Scotland, it's going to be in Australia, where I know that the man I'm passing it on to is going to do the job and educate more. So from a professional point of view, this is the way to go out, go out in a high, and the high is here. I've still got things I want to do in life out with the alcohol trade, you know. I've got a lovely wife and grandchildren, and the grandchildren, I've got two boys, two girls, eight, seven, six, five, and they are absolute dynamite. So I want to, I want to capture that. That's the main game now, is to spend time with the grandchildren, and so you can put some influence in there, because one thing, sure, the one member of the family that always gets remembered is the granddad and the grandma. Maybe not so much now, but historically, they were the backbone of the family. The grandparents always there. When the shit hit the fan, where did you go? You went to your granny or you went to your grandpa. And that's kind of fading a little bit now, but in Scotland, it's still very much the four. The grandparents mean a lot. So I can't do that if I'm not with them, you understand? So I've got to get back home and spend whatever time I have left with them and tell them the stories and show them the island that I was born on and take them out in the storms and see the big seas coming in and all that sort of stuff. So that's where my future lies is with my grandchildren and my children, of course. Thank you. Uh, wrapping up the episode, getting very close to the end, I've only got two more questions for you, Jim. The first one is who would you like to hear on the show? From Australia or from anywhere? Anywhere in the world. Well, the man I would like to hear on the show, it's just not possible because he's no longer with us. But had he been alive, he would have been the number one, and that would have been Nelson Mandela. I mean, to be incarcerated for all these years in total silence and came out sane and forgiving and rising a nation again to follow him. I mean, he must be in my lifetime. He's got to be the one icon above all others. That really impressed me. I mean, it's just the man was, can you imagine? It's so big you can't imagine sitting by yourself for 38 years or 28 years by yourself. Talk about strength of character. That guy had it. And he came out and he said, I forgive you. Yeah, he would be at my table every time. Mm. He was the, he's the only real hero I can look up to. Fantastic guy. Oh, 100%. Nelson Mandela would be an incredible person to meet to hear. What about with a focus on the hospitality industry? Is there anyone who you'd like to hear the insights of? Not really. I think and because I've been on the road so long, I've had hospitality in many, many different countries from everybody from the bellboy to the guy who runs the hotel to the guy who's putting in my seat in an airliner. There's not one particular person. I've been very lucky. I met many, many people, but as a standout in hospitality, I've been in fabulous restaurants all over the world, but then you go back home to Ireland and you get oysters fresh in the sea and the chef there's just done them beautifully, a bit of single malt. Um, so there's no one particular person that's just been able to enjoy other people's talents, you know, whether it be in music or whether it be in distilling. We're all in the hospitality business, but certainly not one particular one. I've had many, many ones. So to answer your question, I can't think off the top of my head of one guy I would die to have cook a meal or teach me how to make a cocktail or that. There's such a huge talent out there. And because of hospitality now, and there's so much on television, we hospitality, there's like 200 million cooking programs, all this stuff, everything's a wash. And there's so many super chefs now, if you went back, 20 years ago, there's probably about six chefs in the world who would be instantly recognised, whether it was the Rue Brothers, whoever it was, you know. But now, chefs are regarded as demigods, you know what I mean? They're up there and are they that good? Who is the judge, you know? So the good thing about from the hospitality business, it's improved. I mean, the competition always improves everything. If you just go to your regular hotel, it's much, much better. The food's better than ever it was before. Restaurants are really trying hard. I mean, there's some amazing, if you went back 20 years ago, you probably had very, very few options. You might have a Japanese or something. Now the options are phenomenal. So from the hospitality point of view, people have got more money, they're flying business fast, they're expecting more. And because the anticipation is higher, the supplier has to go even higher to meet that demand because the people have disposable income and they want the best. So that's what's driving on. It's a mouse in yeah. the wheel. You know, one will drive the other on. But yeah, I've had some phenomenal hospitality. At the end of the day, it's the people who meet you and greet you. It's the biggest thing in hospitality. I mean, I was in Kiev recently doing a show over there, a beautiful hotel I was staying in. The guy in charge, the general manager, was a guy from Scotland. And he picked up, I was from Scotland, he was checking the list. And it was just wonderful what he had done. This chap from Scotland worked really hard at his craft. He had done the cooking, he had done the bartending, all that sort of stuff. And there he was. His guests loved him, so... 
And once again, it's like a distilling thing. It's all about teamwork. If the general manager's doing his best and the guy waiting the table's not, it's a disaster, you know. It's all about educating your staff. And sometimes people have so much disappointment with sloppy service. The guy puts the glass down, right? So I think the hospitality business has got to keep investing in people by proper training. And, you know, people who work in kitchens or people who wait tables or rely upon tips or with more salaries, you should value them. You know, it's just that the guy who makes the whiskey, he might be dead before it's in a bottle. And you've got to value him because he's the guy that did it, you know. So once again, knowledge is a key to everything, whether it's success or whether it's religion or whether it's knowledge about yourself. I come from a small island off the west coast. We're Scottish, we're quite humble people, you know, we're not looking for that. anything too. We're looking for a warm welcome, decent food, good service, and we'll go back. You know, we don't have to have all the fancy stuff. It's an interesting line. Thank you for that, Jim. You guys have something coming up soon that uh, will be very interesting indeed. You want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, we're sort of sitting here, I suppose, what you've got in your glass in front of you. This is, for us, the next chapter of our distillery, which is beyond exciting. Currently, we've just started our whiskey program, which is beyond exciting. So for us, obviously, you know, whiskey all comes from that raw grain barley. Really, you create beer first to distill. So, you know, I get excited about being a young business, doing things a little bit different, and especially doing it in a way that still pays homage to tradition. And that's very much what we're so lucky to learn from but we're doing it in a slightly different way. We're very lucky to have one of Australia's greatest breweries who we as a family regard as some of our closest friends, Stone and Wood, just literally a couple of minutes down the road. are going to be creating the wash for us, for us to distill. And the spirit that we've got is just incredible so far. You know, the fruity notes, but it's got that strong malt driven through. It's, you know, you do things and try to take away a few variables. You know you're going to be good, but we've just been blown away with the, with the mm, quality, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, very quick was it to the brewery stone and woods brewery the variety of beers they were doing was stunning you know and everybody was so enthusiastic and passionate from the wait staff mm. to the brewers and all that sort of stuff so to get a brewer of that caliber supplying us with the beer to make whiskey i was surprised that you could get a brewer who was making beer from malted barley and then you told me i come over and taste it i thought oh my god mm. Mm. and Jamie's obviously been on the show too, so he's got a, a very insightful episode. If you any listeners out there who would like to hear more from, from Jamie, he's out there too. You know, with the guys, you know, they're, they're creating incredible beer, but it's more than just that. And I think he probably no doubt touched about it, you know, this sense of community. They wanted to be that community brewery. Take away the juice and from what we're doing. We're, we're so similar in that respect. And they're just great people doing great things for the right reasons. And that's what we get excited about. First off, the juice is incredible. But yeah, so we're laying those into cars, bringing over quite a sort of depth of American oak. We've got some Jim Beam, some Buffalo Trace, some Jack Daniels, some Woodford coming so we're going to have quite a portfolio but that whiskey you know we lay that down to lie and to rest and to to breathe through that oak that spirit is going to be breathing the same air we're breathing here you know you walk into the rainforest there's a certain smell when you get to northern rivers there's a feel in the air that's different so we're excited about that we don't know because there's been no one that's done this before in this region so that's a uh, something that we get excited about we've got incredible spirit great casks and such a unique environment yeah. I think um, all the key thing here, Eddie, is, is uh, stone and wood beer, the quality of that. Oh. I mean, without their knowledge, and when you go down and you meet the people at stone and wood, the passion they have, they're talking about services, the passion they have, I think they're really quite secretly happy to be involved with a small company making single malt, maybe in the hope of the might get your case of whiskey in 10 years <laughs> time. And it's a really good fit, you yeah. know, so we're, we're very fortunate because at the end of the day, it all starts with the beer, and stone and wood have proven beyond all doubt that this beer makes a great whiskey, truly a great whiskey. So yes. they can be very proud and I'm sure Eddie will he'll produce a great whiskey. On that note, thank you very much for being on the show today and I'm Enjoy very excited show. to see how this whiskey evolves over the years. Fortunately, we're gonna, we're gonna have to taste it along the way. So yeah, we'll be back yeah. here, no <laughs> doubt. The show today was produced by the in-house audio team at Hospopreneurs, led by Jake Olver. Voiceovers were by Angus Brennan. To learn more, head to hospopreneurs.com.